Romany and Back by G. Bramwell Evans. Give me the clear blue sky over my head and the green turf beneath my feet, a winding road before me, and then to thinking. Chapter 17 The Phantom Swimmer, February. The day was beautifully fine. Every field was flooded with sunshine, pale as yet, but still holding out to the world a promise of warmer days. The tops of the trees swayed gently in the breeze, shaking their heads at the sunlight as though they knew that he was a seducer and that winter might still spring upon them. On all sides, however, there were evidence that the sound sleep of the dark months was not so deep. Up in an elm, a thrush poured out a full-throated song. At the back of his mind was the vision of a cosy nest in which would lie four blue-green speckled eggs. This was enough to make any bird sing. The lark quivered aloft, and his song must have penetrated to the depths of burrow and dark retreats, touching all sleepers with a restlessness which made them turn in their beds of moss and leaves and go to sleep again less soundly. In the tops of the elms, the rooks' clamour announced the coming of a new interest. I could see them inspecting the nests, which have had such a buffeting in January gales. As Rack and I entered the low-lying fields, I saw that the plover's plumage had taken on a new neatness, a new sleekness. Gone was the lustreless tone of December, Ivory and white glistened with brilliantine softness. Crests too were in evidence, and a new spirit of pugnacity manifested itself. I saw a pair of birds suddenly square up to each other. No combatants seem to observe more scrupulous Queensbury rules than do these pied rivals. There is a certain etiquette of the boxing ring which is never overlooked. Both birds advanced, and, as they stood opposite each other, they bowed with courtesy and grace, their bills and heads curving towards the grass. Then, having shaken hands, so to speak, the gong sounded. For a moment beaks and wings whirled and jabbed without doing any serious damage. The next moment peace reigned again. Probably it was an outlet for the new energy which bubbled in their veins. By the side of a distant hedge, Rack drew my attention to a lordly cock pheasant who stalked along with all the pomp of royalty. He walked as though he were conferring a favour on the earth by placing his feet upon it. Once he gave forth a raucous challenge. Perhaps it was a reminder to all sportsmen that a truce should be proclaimed now that spring was in the making. In one of the fields I came across the dog sniffing at something. I found two corpses awaiting me, one a rat, at least all that was left of it, the other was the scarred remains of a mole. Both of them had been dead some hours. I wished that Jerry had been with me so that he might have described just what had happened. Then I lifted up the little gentleman in velvet and saw that his spade-like feet were covered with blood and rat hair. Things then became plainer to me. I looked around and saw that the mole had been busy hunting for worms. Here and there were piles of freshly turned up earth, mounds which spoke of his restless energy, and which also told of the mighty appetite which hounds on this little velvet barrel. Evidently he had come to the surface at the very moment when the rat had been on his nightly prowl, probably after bad luck in hunting and possessed by a ravenous hunger. Perchance the rat had heard the little burrower in his tunnel below ground. He had brought his ears and nose into full play and knew to an inch where the soft miner worked. The rat had decided to wait, for he believed that the mole would break the surface of the ground. I should have liked to have seen him sitting there with every muscle coiled up like a spring, with whiskers twitching and eyes blazing, waiting for the first sign of his underground victim. At last, as the mole appeared, with a bound the rat pounced on him. He thought it was going to be an easy win. One quick nip with chisel-like teeth at the base of the skull and then, 
O oh joy! But in the darkness the rodent missed the vital spot by a fraction of an inch, and this was bad for the rat. For the mole turned, and with the fury of a badger, dug his feet into the soft underparts of the rat. No unyielding earth met those clawed spades but warm, tender flesh, and before such an onslaught even thick leather would have split. With a shriek of pain the rat bit deeper. It was his last effort. The next moment he was disembowelled. Then quiet night once more resumed her sway, and the stars looked down upon the pitiful remains of the two combatants, the one with his spinal column severed, the other a mere dilapidated shell. As Rack looked up at me with disgust written on his face, I said, That's the world, the world of tooth and claw, which lies hidden in your master and every mother's son of us. And every time I'm kind to you is really a miracle. So don't you forget it, old man, I added, as I patted him affectionately. He gave my hand a quick, moist lick, which I understood to mean, and don't forget that there's other things in us dogs besides bite and fight, master. And then, giving me a knowing look, he went on with his hunting. In the afternoon we came to the river. The floods had settled, and the river was almost at normal level. Once more the shingle beds fringed the clear stream, every stone polished by the mad rush of the flood waters. Only the muddy twigs and grass, caught in the branches of alder and willow, spoke of the great yellow tides which had swirled and swished through them. I kept the dog to heel, for I was anxious to see any heron that might be fishing some quiet pool. I loved to see him standing on one leg, with all the gravity of an old-time village schoolmaster. We came at last to where the river swims smoothly over a gravel bed, and then falls over the rock into a deep pool. We crept along the fringe of the waters, and I peeped over the edge. For some time I noticed nothing. The cliffs rose sheer out of the dark green water, which, after being churned up by its fall, levelled itself out into a placid sheet. The pine trees mirrored their slimness in it, and the sky overhead reflected itself in patches of blue. At the far end the gorge narrowed, and big rocks did their best to haul back the pool which eluded their grasp by a fine spurt of speed. The dog, who had remained motionless by my side, for he senses those times when stealth and quietness was necessary, suddenly lifted his nose in the air. I never neglect such an action, for I know that some wandering air current has brought interesting news. When, though still on his haunches, he deliberately wagged his tail, I looked around me with keener scrutiny. Below me was a flat rock in shadow, which had a commanding view of the pool. It was partly screened by bushes. At first I thought that the rock had its usual appearance. Then, on looking closer, I saw that a man's boots were sticking out beyond the bushes. These I recognised as belonging to Jerry. He was very intent watching the waters below him. So hidden was he that had it not been for Rack's nose, I should never have noticed him. For some time I waited, but as he made no movement, I flicked a small stone so that it fell on the rock beside him. As I did so, I gave the hoot of the brown owl. The old poacher turned his head without moving his body, and through the bushes saw me peering down at him. He put his finger on his lips to enjoin silence, smiled, and beckoned me to join him, indicating the way by which I was to come. In a moment or two, I crouched beside him. Where's your gaff? I whispered, thinking that he was waiting to invite a salmon to accompany him home. He shook his head and laughed quietly. Not this time. I'm watching them rocks that shove down to the water over yonder. There's an otter somewhere about there. I've caught a glimpse of him once. He'll be out when the sun goes down, I reckon. If he's not gone... All three of us kept our eyes on the shelving rock. Rack sat upright between Jerry and me, alert as either of us, but no sign of life stirred either on or behind the rocks. A slow fanning movement overhead had caused me to look up, and 
and I saw a heron go lazily by. He, not having seen us, commenced to plane downwards towards the rock we were watching. As his feet almost reached the landing place, he changed his mind, lurched violently to one side, and with a hoarse scream of protest continued his flight down river. Our swimming's friends there, all right, whispered Jerry. Reckon that old bared his teeth at old long legs, and he didn't think twice of moving on, did he, eh? A moment or two afterwards, a couple of mallards, with whistling wings, headed in the heron's direction. As they passed the rock in which we were interested, they too swerved and flung themselves higher in the air. I never ceased to marvel at this manoeuvre, so sudden, so sure, so effective in getting them out of the range of immediate danger. Them pair, you saw that they was mated, said Jerry in a low voice, caught a glimpse of the otter too. Next moment my companion nudged me. Simultaneously I felt rack stiffen with excitement. I looked at the rock but saw nothing. He's in the pool, said Jerry quietly. Didn't you see him? I shook my head. All I could see was a dimple on the smooth surface that kept expanding in ever-widening circles. The otter must have slipped out and in again while my attention was on the ducks. I was determined that he should not be missed a second time and so kept my eyes glued on the darkening waters. Suddenly, and almost right beneath us, the smooth shadows were parted. The next moment we saw the otter draw himself out of the water as slick and quietly as though he were a glass tube. I shall never forget that thrill. First of all, he snuffled and blew the water clear of his nose. I could see the sensitive whiskers sticking out each side of his face, and his eyes appeared to be especially round and luminous. Jerry put his mouth to my ear. Looks like a brother of old Bill, don't he? I smiled, for there was a decided similarity to Bairn's father's hero. Then I looked at his long, powerful body from which the icy water dripped on to the shelf of rock, and when he shook himself the fur round his neck stood out like a coarse ruff. The next moment the otter slid into the water again. How with such a body he managed to enter so quickly and with no sign of a plunge I could not understand. One moment he was in full view, the next he was not. The water had silently closed upon him. As though old Bill knew that we were watching, and was determined to give us full value for our money, he again came to the surface. Never have I seen such an exhibition. He turned, squirmed, looped the loop, swam on his side, on his back. Like some mighty eel, he twisted, rushed at the rocks with incredible speed, and, just as we expected him to dash his brains out, put his head down. Then we saw the tail vanishing down the side of the rock, and immediately afterwards his head appeared in the centre of the pool. Once again we heard the familiar snuffle and, as he reared himself in the water, he gave a call not unlike the cluck of a moorhen. Whether it was myself or Rack who, in our interest and excitement, dislodged a stone which crashed into the water, I cannot say. All I know is that there was the sound of a splash. Simultaneously the figure with the creamy breast sank out of view. Nothing remained but the shadowed pool the evening breeze stirring the top of the pines, the rushing of icy water beneath us, and a ripple in the middle of the pool, down the centre of which a phantom swimmer had disappeared.